everyone, and welcome to the Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. This is really an, an honor and a pleasure to um, honor our one of my predecessors, Dr. Redinger, who is formerly chair of the Department of Internal Medicine, and he will have a wonderful introduction to our speaker uh, by Dr. Uh, Craig McClain. Please take it away, Craig. Thanks, Dr. Williams. It's always a pleasure to introduce the uh, Redinger Lecture Series. As Dr. Williams said, Dr. Redinger was our chair of medicine at the University of Louisville for uh, over two decades. At one time, he was the longest uh, sitting chair of medicine in the United States. And he personally took our uh, Department of Medicine into uh, an area of research uh, prominence that uh, at one time, virtually every division director uh, was nationally prominent and had federal funding. Uh, Dr. Redinger also understood the importance of camaraderie and teamwork that even though the Department of Medicine was, seemed to be uh, broke all the time, why we had parties at his house, we were always able to have a Christmas party and the university really owes Dr. Redinger a, a debt of gratitude. We normally uh, have a outside speaker of national prominence uh, give this lecture, and I had one lined up. And then I was uh, talking with Matt Cave, and he showed me a talk that he was giving at another institution. And I thought, geez, you know, we really have to have this talk here, not only because it's a great talk, but it's a timely talk that's really going to change the lives of people in Kentucky. And moreover, Matt absolutely epitomizes uh, what Dr. Redinger would like to see in a young investigator. So Matt did his, he's a native of Kentucky. Uh, he did his GI fellowship here. Uh, he started out with a K award and then developed uh, his own research career. He actually has a disease process named after him, uh, toxic and associated steatohepatitis. He's the world leader in environmental liver disease. And he's gonna talk to us today about metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease or MASL. And he'll tell you all about that, Matt. Thanks, Craig, and uh, I'm really glad to be giving this lecture to you. I was uh, a trainee when uh, Dr. Redinger was chair of medicine, and I joined faculty under his leadership, so you can uh, consider me, uh, you know, in part a Redinger uh, trainee. So here's my disclosures. I've highlighted a couple companies that we're involved in clinical trials with in uh, this disease state. And uh, uh, then below, many of you know my wife, uh, Barbara, who uh, worked for some time at U of L. She's now with AbbVie, so my wife's now on my disclosure slide. <laughs> All right, so before we get started, I want to talk to you about a, a big CME symposium that the GI Division's putting on on March 2nd at the CTRB. I think Jason sent out some information on this. This is a 10-hour CME symposium. Uh, for uh, faculty and then for uh, trainees. If you guys would like to attend, uh, I can promise you, you won't miss a question on the uh, ABIM medicine or GI boards on liver if you come and pay attention. So what are the objectives of the talk? We're gonna review the epidemiology, diagnosis and risk stratification of uh, MASLD and we're gonna review therapies. And so what in the world is MASLD? So uh, MASLD is the new NAFLD. And so this name change occurred in uh, June of uh, 2023 at the recommendation of several of the societies. Uh, why this was done is in the lower left, and there were several reasons, but uh, mainly because the uh, name was somewhat uh, uh, stigmatizing. And so MASLD is here, Metabolic Dysfunction Associated Steatotic Liver Disease. It's one of several other types of steatotic liver disease, with the other one being uh, alcohol-associated liver disease. Uh, here. And then there's some overlap. And these would be, for example, overweight, diabetic uh, patients that drink alcohol. They have what's known as MET-ALD here. And so we're going to be talking about uh, MASL today. Whoops. Having some trouble with my arrows here. I got it. 
So um, here's some uh, practice guidelines that I recommend uh, people go to for more information. All right, so epidemiology. I'm sorry, I'm just having trouble with my, my clickers not working. Oh. All right, now it is. All right, epidemiology of uh, MASLD. So uh, MASLD is a chronic progressive disease. And so people will start with a healthy liver. They may develop fat in their liver. Most of them will have just fat alone without any inflammation or fibrosis. If they get inflammation, they call that NASH, or now that's known as MASH. They can get some scarring, uh, which is called fibrosis. And if they get a lot, that's called advanced fibrosis that can go into cirrhosis, can progress to liver cancer, decompensation, and death. And so a key take-home message of this talk is that uh, uh, what I want all of us to do is to uh, identify the advanced fibrosis. So those are the ones to refer to uh, GI. And I'll tell you how to diagnose and do that in a little bit. And the reason that I want you to focus on those that have the worst disease is that we can't see everybody in GI clinics that have this. So if you figure there's a, a three to four million people in the US, it's estimated that about a hundred million of them have MASLD, 20 million have the more severe form of MASH, and over the next 20 years, there'll be uh, four million uh, new cirrhotics. And so it's also important to know that there's a, a race and ethnic difference in disease prevalence. Uh, in purple is the uh, prevalence of MASLD. You'll see that, or the percentage of all liver disease in different uh, demographic subgroups, and you'll see it's always the most common, but it varies a little bit, and that's due to uh, differences in a polymorphism uh, called PNPLA3, which would probably be a board question for the GI fellows. Uh, we work a lot with liver transplant, and so if only 1% of these MASH cirrhotic patients uh, come to transplant, this is just going to completely destroy the wait list time. So MASLD is common in U.S. clinics, and so this is a, a key point. So uh, uh, Ken Cousy and Endocrine Society has kind of been pushing this. So 70% of people with diabetes have uh, NAFLD or MASLD, and 75% of people that are overweight have this. And so instead of uh, stressing if you're in an endocrine clinic about who has MASLD and who doesn't, they actually recommend you just assume everybody's got it, and then you just move straight to risk stratification. And I think that point's well taken. This problem is getting worse. There's a rising incidence of MASLD. You can see how the numbers are worsening. And then we've all been concerned here uh, about rising rates of obesity and uh, uh, diabetes, which are shown here in uh, red and brown uh, using NHANES data over time. But look at this red line. This is the uh, rates of advanced liver fibrosis, uh, which is rising even faster than the current epidemics of diabetes, obesity, and uh, hypertension. So those were new data from the liver meeting this year. But MASLD is not just a U.S. disease. It's found worldwide uh, with different prevalences. And you can get a hint of, uh, of some of these race and ethnic differences uh, that I was uh, mentioning from this map. So what are the comorbidities associated with MASLD? So that's the classic metabolic things with the strongest connections on the left. There's other connections with less strong uh, uh, conditions with less strong connections on the right. Uh, Craig mentioned our work on chemical exposures, which I'm just going to mention for uh, for briefly in a few slides. Uh, and so uh, Craig mentioned this toxic associated uh, uh, steatohepatitis, which we described in 2010 in the local chemical workers. We've given grand rounds on this before, and I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I think in uh, uh, this particular uh, Redinger lecture, it's important to note that this discovery was made using biorepository samples that were collected by Carlo Tamburo on the left and later saved after a, Dr. Tamburo's death by Dr. Redinger and Dr. McLean when there were some people in the institution that wanted to get rid of it. So fortunately, they saved that. I made a discovery as a fellow and really kind of sparked a new field. And so we've gone from discovery to uh, having this new disease and a practice guideline in less than 10 years, uh, which is my proudest accomplishment. A few developments in that field, which I'm going to discuss, 
uh, including this one, which is really scary from Lita Chatsy's group at uh, Southern California. And she showed that uh, uh, levels of these forever chemicals called PFAS in pregnant moms are associated with the risk that the babies grow up to have NAFL later in life. And you can see here, uh, saw a couple of toxicologists on the, the call today. This is what I would call a perfect dose response curve uh, for that risk. And here you can see the mom's exposures uh, while they were pregnant here are associated with blood metabolites of the kids later in life, suggesting that these chemicals permanently reprogram metabolism. And so I mentioned this just because it's really scary. You know, what if this epidemic of NAFLD and liver fibrosis is in part related to uh, things that our parents or even grandparents were exposed to? Where do we get some of these chemicals? Some were in from foods, industry, uh, such as the uh, train derailment in East Palestine, personal and home care products, medical care. But I'm going to talk about uh, food contaminants. And here's some resources where you can look up what some of these uh, resource, uh, chemicals are. And I'm going to mention uh, one thing here, which is kind of emerging. And I'm doing that for uh, Dr. Williams' sake. Uh, because I know he's interested in plant-based diets. So what's known about red meats and NAFLD? Well, there's some epidemiologic studies that suggest a uh, uh, association between red or processed meat contamination and NAFLD. But when you look a little bit deeper, uh, it's really a consumption of heterocyclic amines, which are contaminating the meats, which have the higher odds ratios and really associated with NAFLD. And what are these heterocyclic amines that are shown here? Well, these are formed when you actually cook the meat in an unhealthy way. You grill it to above a well-done level, or you fry it, and then you get these HCAs. And so I mentioned these um, because uh, uh, David Hine and Farm Tox, his lab, uh, and Kennedy uh, Walls, his recent uh, uh, graduate student, were looking at uh, genetic polymorphisms in this uh, NAT2 gene, which transformed these HCAs into more toxic metabolites. And what they found is that the uh, genotypes uh, did uh, modulate the toxicity of these exposures. And so I bring this up because this is U of L research, and it's related to red meats and plant-based diets, and it suggests that there uh, could actually be a gene red meat uh, cooking interaction. And so when we talk about these diets in NAFLD, uh, it's incredibly complex, and uh, UofL is leading the way in figuring out some of these complicated interactions. So back to reality and clinical practicality, how do you diagnose and risk stratify the NAFLD? So you rule out other liver diseases and you assess steatosis and fibrosis. And this is something we need all of you guys to do at the primary care level because we can't see 100 million people in GI clinic and, uh, and make this diagnosis for the patients. And so uh, some will have abnormal liver enzymes, some will have abnormal imaging of the liver with an incidental finding of fat. Uh, you see those conditions, you exclude other liver diseases, some are listed below, look at metabolic uh, comorbidities, and then key takeaway message is assess the liver fibrosis, because that's what puts them in the high-risk group. And um, if you're uncomfortable with this, AASLD has a tool that'll walk you through it and help you make the diagnosis. Does your patient have abnormal liver enzymes? Have you ruled out hep B and C? Do you have fat on an ultrasound? Do you have components of metabolic syndrome? How much do you drink? And it'll tell you if you have muscle or not, or if your patient does. All right, so what about advanced fibrosis? So this, again, is the key. This is what determines whether your muscle patient's going to live or die and whether they need to be referred. And so what we care about is advanced fibrosis here in the blue. So there's four stages of, or actually five stages of fibrosis. Zero means no scarring. Four means cirrhosis. You can see the nodules increasing in the liver. And what we care about is F3 or F4, and we lump those together, and we call that advanced fibrosis. And these are the ones that we all need to detect and refer because they're the ones that are going to do poorly or at risk to do poorly. And the data for that first came from Paul Angulo when he was at UK uh, down the road uh, in uh, 2015 in gastroenterology. And you can see here that uh, patients with NASH and fibrosis, uh, they had uh, less survival than those that didn't. Uh, I didn't believe these data at the time, but they've been reproduced like a million times since then. Uh, here's kind of the reciprocal of that, looking at probability of uh, 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 
uh, death and you see that it's going up over time if you're three or four so zero or two you do good three or four you do bad here's it the, another way this is looking at just at the liver related mortality by fibrosis stage and here you see the three or four and sometimes the twos are doing worse this makes uh, perfect sense it's intuitive if you got cirrhosis you're going to be more likely to die of your liver um, but here's uh, one that didn't make intuitive sense, but it's also been replicated so many times. It's uh, basically dogma now, and that's all cause mortality uh, uh, depends on your fibrosis stage. So if you're F3 or F4, you're more likely to die of anything. And, and how do these patients die most commonly? It's cardiovascular disease. And so a big change in the field is that we have to do a cardiovascular risk reduction in these patients. So we got to diagnose the fibrosis. So how do we do that? And so the traditional way, the tried and true, still the gold standard, but an imperfect gold standard is the liver biopsy. And this remains the only way you can diagnose steatohepatitis or uh, NASH or now known as MASH, uh, but it has some problems. And so one's uh, variability, it only samples a small portion of the liver and the disease is heterogeneously distributed throughout the liver. And so depending on where the needle randomly hits, you can get very different results. And I'll show an image of this a little bit later. It's expensive. There's adverse events. From time to time, people may even die from liver biopsy. And this leads to uh, patient reluctance. And so it's uh, not a practical thing to be used clinically. And so what's the solution that's emerged uh, over the last several years? And that's something that they call in the field NITS non-invasive test. And so uh, these, this is what uh, I want you guys to be doing and ordering in your practice. You can order all these highlighted things uh, in U of L Epic, or at least calculate the FIB4. And so they're divided into simple scores, proprietary serum tests, and then imaging techniques. And the simple scores are kind of like our MELD score and liver transplant. Uh, you take uh, labs, AST, ALT, demographic factors, plug them into a calculator, and it gives you a score, an ELF score or fibrosures, uh, something you order. It's a dedicated uh, blood test that a uh, little bit better, but you know more expensive. The FIB4 is free because you're going to have a CMP and demographics on your patients. And then the uh, fiber scan, which we just love, and GI, and uh, for the cardiologist, I consider this to be like our calcium scan for uh, hepatology. So how do these NITs perform? So I showed you here on another similar slide where liver biopsy, the fibrosis stage by liver biopsy determines one's likelihood for uh, survival. Uh, but what if you determine fibrosis by the fiber scan or by the FIB4? Does that also determine survival? And it does. Here's evidence-based medicine. And so these are the tests that I want us to be using at U of L to determine this. And indeed, that's what's recommended in the guidelines. So what makes a good NIT? So these are one of those things that has sensitivity and specificity, and you want to rule uh, rule in advanced fibrosis uh, and rule out those that don't have it. And so you, what you get is a lower cutoff value and a lower cutoff value. And if you test a patient and they're below the lower cutoff, there you ruled out the advanced fibrosis. If they're above it, you rule it in. There's a gray area in the middle called indeterminate. And I'll tell you what to do about those in a minute. So what makes a good NIT? It should have a, a area under receiver operating curve as close to one as possible. And so the question is, uh, how do these NITs that I recommend actually perform on that? And so here's a table listing that, and I've highlighted the, the ones that I want us to key on. And I'm, I'm just going to mention there's a, a million NITs out there. And you, the point is, you just need to use something. Uh, you know, these are the ones that I think are most practical for us, the FIB4, the ELF or Fibrosure and the Fiber Scan. So I've highlighted those and you can see the FIB4 performs pretty good, 0.78. The liver biopsy is only 0.87 because it's an imperfect gold standard. So it's not that much worse than the biopsy. The ELF's a little bit better at the uh, price of increased cost and the uh, Fibroscan's a little bit uh, better still. So, so these nets actually uh, perform quite 
quite well. And you can want see that you can move the cutoffs a little bit and that'll change the sensitivity and uh, specificity and performance. But uh, I'll show you, here's a list of some of the cutoffs and I'll uh, talk about those a little bit more later about which ones that I think we should be using in our uh, current practice at UofL and uh, really all of our clinics. So here's how you figure out the FIB4. It's on the MD calc, age times AST divided by platelets times the square root of ALT. You get a number. I'm sure Epic could probably be programmed to give this for us. I'm not sure we've got that set up yet. Uh, fiber scan, this is again the machine that I love that I think is like our kind of equivalent of the calcium scan. So this measures liver stiffness. It's kind of like liver percussion. If you remember that from physical exam training in uh, medical school, but it quantitates it. And really when you're percussing the liver, what you're hearing is the sound, sound waves that are kind of equivalent to the stiffness of the organ. And the stiffness of the organ corresponds to the uh, fibrosis. So the more scar, the more stiff the organ is. And uh, the higher the liver stiffness measurement, with, which is read in uh, kilopascal. So this machine gives a liver stiffness measurement, which uh, converts to fibrosis. And it gives something called a controlled attenuation parameter of cap, which is a muffled signal, which is muffled by fat. And so you get a cap and a KPA that tells us how much fat and how much fibrosis is in the liver. We like this because it's a bigger probe than the biopsy needle, so it, it looks at a bigger volume of liver. It doesn't work in some in all patients, and there can be some false positives or negatives, so it's uh, not a perfect test, uh, but very good. You saw the uh, performance on a previous slide. Um, so the results are reported as a KPA and a liver stiffness measurement and a CAP. How do you interpret that? Well, there's an app for that. And uh, we've got, uh, Craig and I both have residents and fellows in our clinic, and uh, I teach mine to get this app, and it's mindless. It'll tell you how to how to interpret this, and there's uh, different ways to interpret it, uh, but uh, this app has different settings that'll let you do it. Now, kind of the newer kit on the block that we don't have at UofL, which is uh, uh, maybe less practical, but it's probably the best of all is the MRE. So it's an MRI elastography measuring liver stiffness in the MRI. And so it's uh, great because it uh, looks at the uh, whole liver. So instead of 150,000th or 100 times that bigger on the uh, fiber scan, 150,000th on the biopsy, you get the whole liver. So here, if you see, see the liver, if uh, Blue's uh, normal and red cirrhosis. If you randomly stick a needle in blue, you'll say you tell your patient they're normal. If you randomly stick it in red, you'll tell them they have cirrhotic. And the truth's actually somewhere in the middle. And so this is not a homogeneous disease. And really, most liver diseases are not. And why should it be? You know, for the cardiologist on the call, not all coronary arteries get atherosclerosis equally in one in a patient. So why should the liver get uh, equally distributed disease too? Um, so uh, what about ALT? That's one thing I haven't talked about. ALT is not very good. And so, in fact, uh, Sally Condon here, who was one of our graduating fellows with some of her classmates last year, uh, she just had uh, last week a paper accepted where she looked at the performance of ALT to diagnose steatosis that was determined by the FibroScan machine. And so what she found that ALT for the diagnosis of steatosis was no better than the flip of a coin. Uh, in some cases, it was actually worse than random chance to diagnose who had fatty liver. And uh, likewise, it performs incredibly poorly, perhaps even more poorly for liver fibrosis. So don't get fooled into thinking that my patient has a normal ALT and they've just got some fat on the uh, ultrasound. That's an incidental finding that I got for to look at their ovaries or whatever. Uh, don't get fooled and think that uh, that this is uh, you know meaningless and that patient's not important. You have to use the uh, you know the FIB4, which has ALT in it, but is really a much better test for the problems that we're talking about. So uh, those that have done the GI service at Jewish know this too. We have patients with uh, alcohol-associated hepatitis that can die with normal ALT. 
So we've used the fiber scan in some of our research, and I want to come circle back around to, to plant-based diets. And so these are two slides I'm going to show now that I've presented at AASLD this year, where actually one of my colleagues presented for our group on uh, research involving 325 uh, mazzled subjects from a, a clinic at Indiana University. And what we were doing is looking at all the pollutants that they were exposed to uh, through a, a new technology called exposomics. So we measured all these pollutants in blood and uh, using a mass spec in the 325 subjects. And uh, we found that 1,120 of these were associated with uh, uh, liver fibrosis um, by a fiber scan. And not all of these chemical fragments were annotated or, or, we, or the libraries can map what they were. Uh, but 34 were annotated, and here's the ones that are positively associated. But here you can see really some of these fragments, these 1120, those that were positive and those that were negative. And so uh, some of these were also associated, uh, you know, not only with advanced fibrosis or uh, actually this was clinically significant fibrosis. So it was stage two, three, or four. Uh, they were also associated with severe steatosis. And uh, I want to point out some of these. If we've got anyone for, from our super, super fund here, you'll see that there's some VOCs on here. But this one at the top is called iprodione. And so I want to talk about that. It's a fungicide. I never heard of this stuff before, but associated with steatosis or fibrosis. And what is this? Well, this is in uh, peanuts. They spray that on peanuts to prevent the aflatoxin. And so next we uh, looked to see who in the world had this stuff. So these were patients from Indiana and uh, 276 out of 325 had this stuff circulating in their blood. And you could see the intensity or the concentrations really of this stuff in their blood. So three quarters of them had it. And then we looked at their metabolomics in their blood. And so anything over this line significant. So all these little dots were circulating blood metabolites that were associated with this chemical exposure. And then here we did a pathway analysis and pathways associated with steatosis, fibrosis, and both liver steatosis and fibrosis lit up, including the top four, B6 carnitine, keratin, and fatty acids, suggesting that maybe exposures to this chemical uh, mod modified these uh, liver uh, uh, disease pathways to contribute to the observed association in liver fibrosis and steatosis. So I point this out, I, I mentioned earlier a red meat contaminant, which could be driving some NAFLD physiology. Uh, so is the solution a plant-based diet to avoid all that? Well, perhaps, but not if your plant-based diet's contaminated uh, with some toxic pesticides. All right, so back to reality, what do we need to do in clinic? So this is a key slide here. So this is a clinical care pathway. So uh, we should be identifying our patients with MASLD or those at risk with MASLD due to risk factors like diabetes, metabolic syndrome, or incidental finding of steatosis, abnormal liver enzymes, do a focused uh, H&P, ask about alcohol, get liver enzymes. And then the key thing, and a take-home message from this talk is to do the FIB4 calculation. The lower cutoff is 1.3, the higher is 2.67. If it's a low cutoff, these patients are going to are at low risk uh, to die of liver or all-cause mortality. You don't need to refer those to GI. These ones you could keep and you can monitor. You can treat the metabolic conditions yourselves and uh, redo the FIB4 every so often, maybe every two or three years. Now, if it's a high FIB4, these are high risk. So these are the ones that, that uh, you need to refer to us. And uh, what about the ones that are in the middle? Well, these are in, uh, indeterminate risk. And what you do for those is do a second NIT. So they call it sequential NIT testing. So do a second NIT. And in this algorithm, they recommended the fiber scan. And it's the same thing if your cutoff of LSMs less than eight, then those are low risk, you keep them. If they're greater than 12, they're high risk, you refer them. If they're in the gray zone, you could refer those two and uh, let us decide if we wanna do another liver biopsy or not. So this is a decision algorithm for, for uh, who to, how to screen and uh, who to refer. All right, and so why do you want to refer or uh, you want to refer them for therapies? And the ones you keep, you still want to treat them. 
um, but you don't necessarily need to get a hepatologist involved. And so uh, what are the therapies? And so there's really been a revolution, as Craig mentioned, in the thinking of how to manage this pa these patients. And this is from that uh, AACE guideline that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and so here's the, the treatments are focused on prevention of cardiovascular disease and uh, prevention of cirrhosis. And so there's an emerging uh, area in hepatology, a brand new area that I'll talk about a little bit about later called preventative hepatology. So, you know, uh, so Kim, hopefully this is starting to sound like preventative cardiology to you, but uh, this is uh, where we're at. So it's like identifying high risk people on a calcium scan and uh, risk stratifying them and uh, treating them for a cardiovascular risk reduction. We want to do the same thing with our massive patients because they tend to die of cardiovascular disease, but we also want to uh, help prevent the cirrhosis because uh, they also die of liver disease too. And so steps in that include uh, specific things and uh, ways to treat the obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and uh, dyslipidemia. So this is a huge change in the field. Used to be when I started, is it okay to start cardiovascular medicines like a statin? Uh, now I'm telling you, not only is it okay, it's a reason to do it. All right, so what are some of the specific things that we, uh, that we want to do uh, here for weight management? So weight management's key. Uh, lifestyle modifications are the backbone. But for these high-risk patients, Circled here is actually uh, bariatric surgery and the GLP-1 drugs. And so uh, these are recommended to manage the uh, associated obesity. They're not indicated for the uh, treatment of NAFLD, but they uh, are in, under a uh, study and being investigated for that. And there is some evidence that they work for the NAFLD as well. But certainly we want to use them uh, in high-risk patients uh, to uh, unable to treat the obesity. And so weight loss is really the, the mainstay of treatment. I'm going to talk to you about uh, this Madrigal drug, which will be the first drug specifically indicated for NASH that we think will get approved in about six weeks. And so look at the green. So this is the delta between the uh, treatment effect and the placebo effect. And so what we want to look at the green, here's various treatments. This drug is, is probably going to get FDA approved and the delta is here, but look at weight loss by diet and exercise. It's huge. Nothing comes close. And so uh, weight loss is still going to be the, the cornerstone of therapy. Uh, now what about, uh, so diet's important, but uh, what about exercise? So exercise works even in the absence of weight loss. Here's a meta-analysis saying, uh, showing this. And what do you tell patients? So this is what I tell them because there's clinical trial data backing it up. If you want to get rid of steatosis, they need to exercise 150 minutes per week. And if they want to get, get rid of fibrosis, they got to do a little bit higher intensity exercise. So just slow walking will help with steatosis, but it won't help with fibrosis. You got to have at least six METs. Uh, but if you're doing six METs, you only have to do 75 minutes a week. But of course, the more you do, the better. 150 is still recommended. Uh, but if that's an important message is uh, more higher intensity to get rid of the fibrosis. And again, it's the fibrosis that kills. Uh, so what about my patients that say, well, Dr. Cave, I got bad knees and I can't do uh, aerobic activity. Well, uh, here's a study showing resistance training as actually very similar benefits uh, to aerobic uh, training. And so if they can't walk because they got bad knees related to their weight or whatever, have them uh, sit in a chair and do some resistance training, they'll still get some benefit from that. Now, uh, we get asked a lot about uh, different diets. And what uh, I think Craig and I and probably my partner spent a lot of time on is tell them to get off the sugar-sweetened beverages and drink more coffee. And so uh, if coffee was a drug, it would be a billion-dollar-a-year drug for uh, liver disease. And in fact, there's a, a compound in coffee, probably a polyphenol. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's a very good a uh, good agent for uh, liver disease, apparently. So people that drink two plus cups of coffee a day have one half the rate of liver disease uh, compared to those that don't. And uh, it really risk reduces liver cancer. And so uh, this is why my partner, Dr. Barve or Steve McClave are never gonna get bad liver disease because they drink coffee like it's going out of style. And anecdotally, when I tell this to patients, they tell me the same thing in my NASH clinic. Well, Dr. Cave, I, 
hate coffee. It's putrid. I can't even stand the smell. And so I, I would love a fellow or resident to do this study. I, I, I believe that patients that love to drink coffee, they don't come to fatty liver clinic uh, because the coffee keeps them out. And those that do, every so often I'll get one that says, oh, well, I'm glad you told me that because I just love to love coffee. And uh, they're the ones that have F0 to F1 fibrosis and don't need to be there uh, anyway. So, so this is actually in the European guidelines to drink coffee. It's not in the American guidelines, but I'm a big believer. There's even animal models now for NAFL where you feed them uh, ground up coffee beans and they get better. So what about uh, medical weight loss? So I talked about the GLP-1. So they improve NASH in uh, up to 60% of patients, uh, but they don't improve fibrosis. And that's been shown in two phase two clinical trials. We don't have any phase three data yet, but the phase two data suggests that the GLP-1s are associated with uh, about 50% NASH resolution, but not fibrosis reversal. Uh, but you gotta get to them early before they have cirrhosis. So what about bariatric surgery? So it works for NAFLD, and not only does it work for NAFLD, it, reduce, it works for NAFLD-related HCC with some new data uh, showing that in a, a meta-analysis. And then what about cardiovascular events in uh, patients with NAFLD? They get bariatric surgery. Uh, more new data here. And they show decreased events in those that get bariatric surgery versus no surgery here. And it's actually a 50% risk reduction. You know, So if this was a medication, uh, it would be malpractice if we didn't give it to our patients, if we could reduce the risk of heart attack by 50%, but uh, uh, payers don't like to pay for this. But uh, uh, I think really over time, the uh, the GLPs are I hope, I'm hoping will out, even outshine some of this, but uh, we've got great data for bariatric surgery. Uh, so what about diabetes? So again, if you have a diabetic patient, preference should be given for the GLP-1s. There are some efficacy data for pioglitazone in NASH, but that's kind of fallen out of favor a little bit because uh, it's associated with obesity. So here's a, another indication for the uh, uh, GLP-1s, uh, particularly in the uh, intermediate or high risk. Do keep in mind in your diabetics that if someone comes in with decompensated cirrhosis, you have to be careful. And if they're a child pew, uh, you know, C certainly uh, probably ought to get them off, uh, you know, metformin at least. Uh, so what about the hypertension? How do you treat that? It's ACEs and ARBs across the board. And what about dyslipidemia? I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, because we want people to get their statins. So statins are recommended for NASH. So this is a, a change. Again, when I was a fellow, the consults were, my patient has abnormal liver enzymes. Can they take a statin? Here's a figure showing because they have abnormal liver enzymes, they need to take a statin. Uh, so that's been a, a, a real change in the field. And uh, the newer drugs you can use as uh, second line add-on uh, agents too. And so another slide on statins, do they work to reduce cardiovascular risk in that NAFLD patients? I don't know what they, why they wouldn't, but here's evidence-based medicine data showing that they do. Uh, percentage of patients with cardiovascular events on statin was 10% in this study versus 30% that weren't. So it cut, cut by a third. Bariatric surgery cut by 50%, so I guess it's better than a statin. Uh, but statins are very good. But how many people are on a statin uh, that ha with NAFL that have an indication? Well, only about half of them are. So that's a, you know, if one take, key take home was do the FIB4 on your patients, a, a second key take home is put the ones on statins that need it that have NAFL. All right. So uh, uh, what about the new therapies for NASH? So we still don't have an FDA approved medicine for NASH. We thought we were going to get one last year for intercept, uh, obeta-colic acid, a uh, FXR agonist. It's currently indicated for use in PBC, and it was actually the first drug ever shown in a phase three clinical trial to meet its primary endpoints of uh, uh, fibrosis improvement in NASH, uh, which again is what kills people and important, so we want a drug for that. We were hoping it would get approved, but you can see by the stock price it tanked and the company was ultimately sold. And, and why did it tank? Uh, well, it tanked because it had uh, side effects, including dyslipidemia. And although it was uh, 
uh, had demonstrated efficacy, uh, FDA advisory panel concluded that the uh, risk from side effects uh, was not worth the benefit and uh, uh, voted uh, unfavorably for this drug. But uh, there's hope for the future. And so uh, this drug has uh, got a PDUFA date of March 14th. Uh, so in six weeks, we may have the first drug from NASH. This is a, a small company, Madrigal, and you can see uh, how it's doing on its stock. So it uh, jumped up here uh, based on a uh, press release showing that it met its phase three in point two, and it uh, uh, was associated with significant improvements over placebo from uh, uh, NASH resolution. So it made the NASH go away, and it also made the fibrosis go away. Uh, but do look, it's, it's not like a hep C drug. It's more like an IBD drug. It only worked in a quarter to a third of patients but this was up to threefold better than the placebo. And uh, what are its side effects? What well, has good side effects? So, so it's a thyroid beta agonist. So it makes the liver selectively hyperthyroid. And when it uh, does that, the hyperthyroid liver burns off the fat and its side effect is it improves uh, blood lipids as well. And uh, so the way that this works is there's thyroid alpha and thyroid beta receptors. And the alpha receptors are the ones that are in the heart and the eyes. And so you activate those, you get the exophthalmos and you get the tachycardia. Then when you activate selectively the ones in the liver, you get that, make the liver selectively hyperthyroid and make it burn off fat, not only within the liver, but also in the blood and you decrease the fibrosis along the way. So uh, clearly this is exciting news. Uh, and this is one reason why I wanted to give this grand rounds because uh, if you can imagine a disease for a hundred million people in the US that don't have a drug indicated for it, uh, you know, we may have one in six weeks. So a new drug for a common disease, first drug for a common disease is always a good reason for a grand rounds. But clearly that's not the answer uh, by itself. Again, it only worked in a quarter to a third of patients. It's don't know what the label's gonna look like. It's probably gonna get approved only for those at higher risk, the ones with fibrosis, uh, but we'll have to see even if it, if it is approved uh, based on the stock market, the uh, market looks very favorably on that. Uh, but there is a pipeline because a quarter of patients is not everybody. And so a lot of drugs were doing clinical trials and some of them here at UofL. The, uh, one of the more exciting ones that was presented at AASLD was the 3G drug. So uh, GLP-1s are one of the Gs. There's also uh, 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 gastrin uh, and glucagon as well and uh, receptor activation. And this drug from Lily Retitrutide activates all three of those receptors. And look at this, this was NASH resolution. So at the high drug, high dose of the drug, it uh, uh, took the, cured the NASH basically in 93% uh, of patients in 48 weeks. So they had no liver fat or less than 5%. So on liver biopsy, the, the uh, fatty liver was completely resolved in 93% of patients in 48 weeks. So, uh, uh, and this was of course associated with massive weight loss too. So uh, this is incredibly exciting. We might have a drug in the future that can cure this disease in the majority of patients, just like we did with hepatitis C a few years ago. So where does this put us in terms of uh, public health? So you can imagine with 100 million people, I uh, started with those sobering numbers. This is a huge public health problem. And again, this is like hepatitis C. We did this several years ago in terms of uh, 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 what's a public health agenda in terms of hum the human economic uh, burden, making people aware to get tested, making providers aware to test them, which is why we're doing this today, uh, treatment and care, uh, uh, policy, but what, what, what I want to talk to you about is uh, models of care to finish up with, and so uh, there's a vision that I have. We don't have this yet, but you can imagine when we're doing uh, uh, prevention of cardiovascular disease and prevention of cirrhosis uh, that we need a, a dedicated clinic for this, and this is this new field of preventative hepatology, and so there's only one or two papers on this in PubMed, and I was just on a advisory board uh, for Novo Nordisk with a bunch of uh, really bright young hepatologists from across the country that are launching this field. They're calling themselves preventative hepatologists, 
and I've never heard of this before, but these were very bright young people. Uh, they were hepatologists, and most of them had done the uh, obesity medicine boards too. And so they were kind of like a hybrid between a hepatologist and an endocrinologist, and they were doing all these things that I mentioned to treat the patient hol holistically. And so this is really, you know, the uh, NAFL clinic you can be reimagined as the birth of a new field of uh, preventative hepatology, you know, which again would be analogous to uh, preventative cardiology. And so this is exciting. And, uh, you know, my vision would be for us to consider launching such a clinic at UofL Health to, uh, uh, with the objectives of to reduce all-cause mortality, improve the comorbidities, you know, we've got a new bariatric surgery and endoscopy clinic coming with uh, Dr. Liu, um, so we can interact with them, as well as the other relative specialties, uh, prescribe the new muscle medications, you know, which we should have approved in uh, as little as six weeks and enroll people in uh, clinical trials. So my second vision before I close is uh, just some work we're doing for military and veterans health. So uh, MASLD is also a huge problem in the VA. And uh, there was uh, last year, uh, uh, maybe two years ago now, there was a lot of talk on burn pits and there was legislation with uh, Joe Biden on the burn pits, which led to a congressionally directed uh, medical research program. And several members of uh, the Department of Medicine responded to that to investigate uh, causes of uh, MASLD and veterans related to wartime chemical exposures. And we received three awards on that one to Manrita Wolong on burn pits. And then uh, myself and Dr. Watson got two others looking at the VOCs uh, related to uh, uh, Camp Lejeune uh, exposures, which you may you may have seen those ads on uh, on TV. So this is a, a second new focus uh, is on military and veterans health uh, and our GI group related to MASLD. So our summary, you know, this was a whirlwind tour, but we uh, covered a lot in terms of MASLD epidemiology and approach to diagnosis and risk stratification. Again, Fib four is the key take home, you know, do this on your patients. You know, we don't care what the AST or ALT are, if, even if they're normal, we care what if they have advanced fibrosis. So uh, that's a take home. Uh, we reviewed the therapies for MASLD, get the low hanging fruits, get the ones on a statin that need it. Uh, we talked about emerging areas of uh, preventative hepatology and environmental health. And uh, the picture on the right was from our liver meeting, which is our uh, AASLD, our big liver society uh, that met uh, last November. And when I started doing environmental health about a decade ago, uh, we were happy when they put our poster in the last row because the last row was by the bathroom and then maybe somebody would come and look at our research on their way in and out of the bathroom because that was the only time they, uh, anybody would come by to talk to us. But we've uh, uh, been getting the word out and now environmental toxins and liver disease uh, abstracts were highlighted in the best of the liver meeting, which is the wrap up at the end. And uh, so we have two, well, one from my group and then one from uh, our uh, Uliana Beyer, who was one of our uh, prior COBRA mentees and uh, Craig's uh, uh, hepatobiology and toxicology COBRA uh, from Pittsburgh. And so it's uh, been really fun to, to kind of uh, help push that uh, field forward. And I'll close uh, and leave this slide up and encourage anybody that wants more information on other chronic liver diseases, such as viral hepatitis, cirrhosis, PBC, alcohol-associated liver disease, and liver cancer to uh, sign up and come to our CME uh, symposium uh, on March 2nd. Uh, and you can get to that through that uh, um, these links here. So uh, I'll end there and uh, happy to take questions. All right. I think, uh, well, Dr. Cook, Dr. McLean, I think you're muted. So I don't know if I'll definitely let one of you guys have the first shot. <laughs> Dr. McLean, would you like to leave the questions? Sure, Matt. So um, actually a quarter of a century ago, why all the nutrition societies got together to meet at one time and publicize a under-recognized problem in the United States obesity. And, uh, so now we recognize it, and now we're actually going to get some new drugs for it. So who do you think is going to be prescribing these? Is this going to be 
gastroenterologist, hepatologist, or endocrinologist, cardiologist, primary care? Is it going to be a combined clinic? What, what do you see uh, happening? Well, I think it's going to take everybody, you know. And so, you know, you and you're aware, uh, you know, on our Thursday clinics, patients just can't get in. There's not enough GI guys to see and prescribe these. But I also recognize that there's not enough primary care providers either. And so I think it's going to take all of us uh, working together at every step along the way and uh, having pharmacy support uh, uh, in the clinics really been really been helpful for me. So it'll, it'll be a team effort for sure. Um, anecdotally, it's a very interesting to note, you know, how big this industry is going to get. And I, I think you've probably seen this, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, market cap for Novo Nordis is now bigger than the rest of Denmark combined. So uh, uh, that'd probably be the same for Eli Lilly with this triple G drug in the future in Indiana, I'm sure. <laughs> Right. It looks like we uh, have a question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there, no, there are a handful in the uh, in the chat uh, to go over, but uh, wanted to go back to the heterocyclic amines that's usually paired with uh, the uh, performance of high heat, direct flame on meat, apparently. And uh, but you're very clear that if you don't do that, that the uh, it's there's in addition to the HCAs, there's the polyaromatic hydrocarbons that make mm -hmm. that cooking technique so dangerous. Uh, why can't we somehow publicize this? This data has been around for a while, not specifically about the liver, but about the cancer causing, for example. Um, what is it about th the way we do things that stops this message from getting out? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and. Uh... You know, as you, you're probably aware, David Hine investigated the HCAs initially for their cancer-causing properties and now looking into mm -hmm. metabolism, too. Now, he extended that by showing there's a gene gene interaction, maybe, with the cooking method, so it's much more complex. But uh, you raise a great point, you know, what are we going to do at a policy level or a publicity level to get this out? And that, that's why I included a, a kind of slide at the end uh, you know, acknowledging, uh, you know, this uh, public health problem, you know, how are we going to address this? I, I don't know the answer to it, but uh, your question was spot on. We have a couple questions in the chat. The first is in regards to coffee. Does decaf make a difference? Yeah, so decaf works too. So I used to think it was the uh, Caffeine, because we have this drug pentoxyphylline we like to use, which uh, is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor for liver disease, just like caffeine's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. But it's been shown that decaf works. It's not the caffeine. It's another compound in the coffee, probably a uh, polyphenol. So caffeine works just fine. And the next question is, what is the significance of the platelet count in the FID4 calculation? Yeah, so the platelet count's uh, critical, and actually, uh, you know, with uh, when I'm staffing patients in the GI clinic or fellows clinic, when they present a uh, liver patient to me, the first question I ask them is, what's their fiber scan show? And if they don't have a fiber scan, uh, my next question is, uh, what's the platelet count? And so if, uh, if the platelet count's low, that's kind of kind of like a poor Poor, poor man's uh, or poor provider's ultrasound, you know, because it's kind of reflective of the splenomegaly and splenic sequestration. So that's uh, that's critical. Age is critical uh, because it takes a long time to get cirrhosis from a chronic liver disease that smolders like fatty liver and uh, platelet counts also critical. Great. Couple more questions from the, the chat. Um... How do you see a way out of the environmental toxin dilemma? Are we going to have to mitigate the individual risk factors such as obesity, diabetes, et cetera, to overcome these problems? Yeah, so this is a, another great policy question. So, uh, and I, our collaborator that does the omics, I was on a call with him uh, uh, two days ago, Dean Jones, and I, I said, Dean, do we just need to go to a vegan diet? And he said, well, you know, the problem is that you know, I'm not vegan, I'm, um, organic diet. Maybe it's organic vegan. I don't know if that's such a thing, but organic diet is what I meant to say. And, uh, you know, that's not contaminated with these things. And he said, well, you know, the problem is, is many of these organic uh, produces are grown overseas. 
And he said there's actually uh, regulations when you have to import them, when you import them, that the U.S. government uh, is so terrified of having parasites and the strawberries or whatever, that when the organic food comes across the border, the first, first thing they do is spray it. <laughs> and so I, I don't know that you could even get uncontaminated organic food at the, the supermarket. And so this is a, another public health question. You know, clearly these pesticides are good because they prevent famine you know we didn't have them maybe we wouldn't have enough food to feed everybody you know but they come at a cost and you know this work is suggesting of obesity diabetes and fatty liver and uh where's the balance and just for just for quick reference i posted i posted the link in the chat area uh, remember dr mark pfeiffer did a great talk about the benefits of coffee a couple of years ago at grand rounds so Posted the link to that if anybody wants to check that out. So, thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Matt. Uh, this is uh, Ashutosh, and uh, thank you for that fantastic uh, overview of uh, uh, of Massold and uh, Mash. Um, one thing uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, my interest is liver cancer, and uh, 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 I think everybody knows about the risk of liver cancer. Uh, in cirrhosis, uh, what can you tell us about uh, risk of liver cancer in in uh, uh, mast cell or, and, and mash? Can you uh, highlight that? Yeah, thank you for uh, asking that. So uh, clearly, you know, in in most liver diseases, you have to have cirrhosis before you can develop HCC. Um, cirrhosis is the precancerous condition, uh, but in some liver diseases, such as viral hepatitis B. And uh, also with fatty liver, uh, you can get hepatocellular carcinomas in non-serotic patients. Now with fatty liver, they usually have some fibrosis, but not always. And I just had a clinic patient with this. The, um, and so the question is, is uh, it happens, uh, but does it happen often enough that we need to screen these patients with ultrasounds? You know, coming back to this preventative hepatology kind of theme. Uh, which we've been doing forever, and uh, uh, the it's uh, uh, been determined on cost-effective analysis that uh, it's not cost-effective to screen uh, non-serotic uh, NAFLD patients uh, for HCC, so it's not recommended by the societies, uh, but clearly these things uh, you know, do happen. Um, I have a personal belief that some of these are going to be ultimately found to be associated with environmental toxins. And there's actually uh, uh, large multicenter epidemiology studies ongoing in South, for example, Southeastern United States to look at metal levels. Um, and this is one that, you know, I think Craig knows about from uh, uh, interactions with Anna May Deal and some of the, uh, I think it was cadmium in, uh, around Durham, North Carolina, that they're seeing cancers uh, in. And so uh, I think that's going to hold up. So the other answer to Ashito's question, Drink your coffee. So coffee has an incredibly strong effect on decreasing liver cancer. And then there's a question in the chat about exercise. And um, 75 minutes of heavy exercise or 150 minutes of um, standard exercise like walking will decrease your NASH risk. One more question from the, the chat, Dr. Cave, um, Dr. Murphy in primary care asking about the cost of fiber scan, um, suggesting that for motivating patients to make lifestyle changes, imaging over, for example, like a FIB4 calculation may convince them to get more serious and make change, but, you know, potential has potential so, cost associated with it. Um, you know, I don't think it's very high. It's in the low hundreds. And, and Ashutosh may know better than me because he's the one that's reading most of those now. But I do know that uh, that these are covered. I've never referred a patient that uh, for FibroScan that came back complaining that they didn't get the bill. 
And in fact, what I found is that uh, patients love fiber scans. So if I order an MRI because they've got a liver nodule and I think they may have liver cancer, they never call for the results. But if they get a fiber scan, by God, they're calling immediately because they want it. And they want to get it every year because they want to know if it's getting better or worse, even though we don't need it every year. So patients love fiber scans, Dr. Murphy. So uh, they're on Epic. And uh, you know, I'd encourage everybody to consider ordering them. But if you look at it from a public health standpoint, you know, for uh, cost effectiveness, the, the FIB4 is what's recommended. But for any one patient, you know, it may be motivating for them to go. Uh, and sometimes when patients lose weight, I send them back because I want to see, you know, they can see that the fat's gone. You know, they lost 20 pounds and the fat's gone and the fibrosis got better. And that's motivating to them, too, I believe, to, to maintain that weight loss. Dr. Joplin dropped in the chat $127 for fiber scan. Yeah. So Dr. Barve is not going to get rich reading these. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like someone let us know that there is a dot phrase in Epic to calculate the FIB4. Not sure a full great. phrase, but it starts with dot FIB4. Okay. Thank All you. right. Well, it looks like we're here at uh, our nine o'clock closing time. Dr. McLean, did you want to say any closing remarks? No, I just want to say this was a fantastic grand rounds. And uh, we encourage everybody again to come to the liver conference that we're putting on early in March. Uh, so uh, the uh, residents uh, or anybody affiliated with U of L can uh, register and go there for free on that and uh, continue to refer patients uh, to clinic. Thank you. All right, thank you. And thank you so much, Dr. Cave. And, Everybody uh, have a great week. And just real quick, I did put the link to the uh, liver symposium in the chat. Um, so if anybody wants to scroll back up just a, sh just a little bit, you can find it there. And uh, also Dr. Cave, uh, we got you a bat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I've got it in my office, and I'll uh, I'll I'll I'll, I'm, I'll I'll be there tomorrow. I'll run it by. I'm I'm guessing your office is over at CTR. Yeah. If, well, thank you. Uh, yeah. If you could drop that off or I'll come next week. I, you know, I'm at home with a uh, COVID quarantine, so I don't want to get a bat and give you COVID. Yeah. Um, and uh, I got a text from uh, Dr. Sadlow, uh, and I should mention this too, that uh, and this was one of my memories of Dr. Redinger too, you know, and a, a couple of them. So it is picture he had a blue suit on. So that's why I put on a blue suit to remember him. And I remember him <laughs> in his blue suit sitting in the front row of Grand Rounds, you know, even after he retired, he came religiously. Yes, and, he did. Uh, Henry asked me to mention that. Uh, and that's a fond memory I have of, uh, of Dr. Redinger. Fantastic. Yes, thanks for giving so, this, this talk in his honor. So Dr. Today. Cook? Yes. So you'll you'll be doing Cardinal Minute though, right? I sure will. Yeah. So Fantastic. we'll um, we'll yeah. close uh, this session, and then uh, Dr. Cave, um, if you just want to close out, and then actually come right back onto the same Zoom link, uh, just you and Jason and I will do that, and we'll we'll record our Cardinal Minute quickly. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming to this excellent talk. Thanks, everybody.